If you have the right SaaS unit economics, you could be in the perfect position to bring investors in and aggressively scale your business. But if you aren't tracking your metrics correctly, you could completely miss this opportunity. The best startups track four different metrics to make sure that as they scale, they scale with increasing profitability. And in this video, we'll walk through them all. Hi, I'm Eric Andrews, a fractional startup CFO. Let's get started. Okay, so today's lesson is going to be broken down into six different sections. First, we're going to talk about what unit economics are for SaaS and why they're important. Then we're going to break down all of the different components of unit economics. After that, we are going to calculate each piece of unit economics. So first, we'll talk about customer lifetime value. Then we'll talk about CAC, which is customer acquisition cost. Then we'll talk about the LTV to CAC ratio, how to calculate that and what it means. And finally, in part six, we'll talk about the CAC payback period, plus some benchmarks so you can know what good and bad performance looks like. Okay, let's get started. Section one, what are SaaS unit economics and why do they matter? So the definition of unit economics is this. It's just the financial breakdown of your lifetime relationship with one individual customer. So what does this tell us? Fundamentally, this tells us if we make money on our relationship with each customer, how much money do we make? And when do we make the money? When do we break even on that relationship, for example? So for each customer, we need to break down our revenue, direct costs, marketing costs, total profit on both a monthly basis and over the entire lifetime of each customer. So why does this matter? So of course, if you aren't making money on each individual customer, you don't have a viable business. So for example, if you invest a certain amount of money in marketing, say $1,000, you need to be making multiples of that $1,000 back on the relationship with the customer over some period of time. So the ratio of lifetime profit divided by marketing, the customer lifetime duration, and the payback period are essential metrics for operating SaaS startups and attracting SaaS investors. Section two, the components of SaaS unit economics. So just remember that whenever you're thinking about unit economics, it's just any metric broken down, but it has to be on a per customer basis. So let's walk through some of the most important metrics that we think about when we're doing unique economics analysis. So first we have our average monthly revenue per customer. Then you'd have your average monthly gross profit per customer. So just how much is the profit that you make from that revenue? So you'd subtract all your direct costs. Then you have your average length of a customer lifetime. Usually we measure this in months. So you could say it's a 40 month customer lifetime on average for a certain SaaS product. Then you have your average lifetime revenue. So this is just your monthly revenue times the number of months that you typically have in your customer lifetime. Then you have your average lifetime gross profit. So again, your monthly gross profit times the number of months in the customer lifetime. And this represents how much profit you make off your lifetime relationship with each individual customer. This is also known as your customer lifetime value or your LTV. Next, you have your average sales and marketing costs that you invest to acquire one new customer. This is also known as your customer acquisition cost or your CAC. Next, you have your LTV to CAC ratio. So this is how many multiples of your CAC do you make back in profit on each individual customer? And then finally, your CAC payback period. So how long does it take to break even on your relationship with one customer? So these are the main important pieces of unit economics for SaaS. Okay, in part three, I'm gonna show you how to break down the customer lifetime value for SaaS. So the setup here is that we have a B2B SaaS business with implementation revenue. So customers pay us some implementation fees to customize the product. And then after that point, they pay us a subscription to receive the product on a monthly basis. So here you can see we have an income statement and just as a reference point, we are saying that in this month, we onboarded six new customers, and then our total customer count, including those six customers, was 96 active customers within the month. So here you can see the revenue. We have implementation revenue of $48,000. So that was related to onboarding those six customers. Then we had total subscription revenue of 206. Then we had some discounts and also uh, the refunds. So next we have our COGS, implementation costs, customer service, 
in credit card processing fees. This is a very typical cost of sales breakdown for a SaaS business, and that's $48,000. So our total gross profit for the, cut for the company is $184,000 at a 79% gross profit margin. Also split out the subscription side of the business and the implementation side of the business because the implementation would have a probably a lower gross profit margin. So I want to see the gross profit margin of the pure subscriptions. So here I said, let's leave out the implementation revenue and let's just pull in the subscriptions, discounts, and refunds, which would all be related to the subscriptions. So that's $184,000 in revenue. And then hosting would be related to the subscriptions, customer service, credit card processing fees. So that's 25,000 of COGS. So you can see that our gross profit here is 159 at 86%. And with subscription revenue, you want to be, uh, have at least an 80% gross profit margin uh, if you're running a SaaS product. And then for the implementation revenue, we had the 49,000 of implementation revenue. We're saying that we paid our internal staff $23,568 to do the implementation. So the margin on that revenue is about 52%. Okay. And you'll see below why we needed to break this apart to, to get to the bottom of our customer lifetime value. So first off, I want to understand what is our implementation revenue per customer. So here we had uh, $48,000 divided by the six customers that represented that implementation revenue. Then we know the gross profit was 52%. So we have our gross profit divided by the six customers. So that's $4,000. $233 of gross profit, implementation gross profit per customer. Now we have our subscription revenue per customer. So we have our total subscription revenue divided by the total customers. Sorry, this is the total. Now we have our subscription revenue per customer. So we have the 184 divided by our total customers, which is 96. This is how many customers are on subscriptions. <clears throat> And then here we can see the 159,000 of gross profit from subscriptions divided by the 96. So total subscription gross profit per customer is 1658. Okay, so now we have sort of our monthly revenue and monthly gross profit per customer, which we were talking about up above. So we have the first couple pieces of this. So now we need the average length of the customer lifetime. So in order to get the average length with the subscription business, you generally need to look at the churn rate, which is the monthly cancellation rate for your customers. So in our case, we're saying that the monthly churn rate is 1.8%. So in any given month, roughly, we are losing about 1.8% of our customers. So here is how to calculate the average customer lifetime. What you do is you just take one and you divide it by the churn rate. This is a, a formula that's brought from statistics. And so what you would see in this scenario is the average customer has a lifetime of 56 months. So if we're losing 1.8% of our customers per month, the typical customer will be um, buying our subscription for an average of 56 months. Now, if we wanted to convert this into years, we would just take the 56 and we would divide it by 12. Keep a close eye uh, on whether you're provided a churn rate that's a monthly churn rate or an annual churn rate because you're going to have to convert the result either back into years or from years back into months. So now let's think about the total customer lifetime value. This is the total gross profit we make on our lifetime relationship with the customer. So first off, we know that we have uh, 1658 of gross profit per month from subscriptions times a 56 month average lifetime. So we make about 92,000 on uh, profit from subscriptions. But we also make a little bit of profit on implementations, but remember implementations just go on for one month. So the implementation gross profit per customer is $4,233. So the total customer lifetime value uh, are, are just these two buckets added together. So that's $96,316 of customer lifetime value for this SaaS business. Okay, now in section four, I'm gonna teach you how to break down the customer acquisition cost for SaaS. So we're gonna continue with our example of the B2B SaaS startup 
And this SaaS startup we're saying has an enterprise sales team. So one thing to note is that B2B SaaS startups usually have sales teams. B2C SaaS startups often do not have sales teams because they have lower priced products. So they can just bring traffic to the website and convert them right there. If the product is, let's say, $20 or $50, uh, customers don't need any sort of human interaction to educate them about the product. But in our case, we do have a sales team. And the expenses that you want to include in CAC generally are the expenses that touch the customer directly when they're coming in and thinking about buying and converting. So in that case, the sales team would, would of course be touching the customer, but sort of someone on the marketing team, let's say the SEO manager might not be touching the customer very directly. So a lot of times you would exclude those types of expenses from your CAC. So here we have the ad spend, of course, that's touching every lead. We have conference expenses. We're saying that we send our sales team out to conferences to get in front of new prospects. With the compensation of the sales team, we have public relations, getting our brand out there, and we have other marketing software. So maybe some of this could be influencer marketing. Maybe some of this is uh, outbound email campaign software. So the total sales and marketing expenses that touch the customer when we're trying to convert them are 121. And then from all of that spend, how many customers did we acquire? New customers we acquired were six. So the customer acquisition cost is the total sales and marketing expenses uh, that touch the customer divided by the new customers acquired. And in this case, that is $20,222. And in the next section, we're gonna compare CAC to LTV to understand how much money we actually make on our relationship with each customer. Hey everyone, one quick announcement. I just wanted to let you know that registration for my training program, Finance for Startups, is now open. If you don't already know, Finance for Startups is a training bootcamp I designed to teach you everything I know about startups. It includes 20 hours of lectures, five hours of live case studies and open Q&A sessions, lifetime access to our community, personalized support for me, and more. If you're interested to learn about how you can secure your spot in the program, check out the link in the description below. Okay, back to the video. Okay, in section five, now let's talk about the LTV to CAC ratio and what it means. So first off, we've already calculated all of our data. So we have the LTV, which is 96,000, divided by our CAC, which is 20,000. So here we see that we have a 4.76 LTV to CAC ratio. This means for every $1 that we put into marketing, we make back $4.76 of profit. So that's a very good return on investment if you're acquiring customers and making back five times that investment over the lifetime with each customer. Investors look at these ratios closely and then operators should of course be benchmarking themselves to understand, you know, do we need to increase LTV? Do we need to get more efficient on CAC? How do we sort of manufacture or engineer a better LTV to CAC ratio? And the higher your ratio, the more profitable your company will be. So in terms of benchmarks, B2B and B2C are a little bit different. B2B startups generally make infrastructure and products that customers need, and B2C startups generally make products that customers want. So naturally, B2C has higher churn rates and lower customer lifetime values. So um, in terms of benchmarking, bad for B2B is sort of one to two. That's, that's not very good. Probably your customers are churning off at a very high rate if you're in the one to two range. B to C would be one. If you have an LTV to CAC ratio less than one, it means you lose money on your relationship with every single customer. So you should pause all of your marketing and figure out your business. Average for B to B is sort of the two to five range. That's you know pretty good, decent. B to C is more of the one to three range. And then excellent LTV to CAC ratios for B to B SaaS is five to 10 plus. And then B2C is more of the three to five range. There's exceptional companies that have really, really high ratios outside these ranges as well. And the later stage a company is, sort of the higher the ratio should be. If a company is in its first year or whatever, uh, a lot of times these benchmarks will be a little bit lower. I actually have a video about LTV to CAC benchmarks over the life cycle of a SaaS startup. And so I'll put a link to that video in the description below. Section six, CAC payback period plus benchmarks. So we know because of our LTV to CAC ratio that when we invest a dollar in marketing, we make 
$5 back in profit, but the payback period is gonna tell us what are the cash flow dynamics and over what period of time do we become profitable on that initial CAC and then what's the tail on sort of those profits. So we wanna understand once we put in the CAC and acquire the customer, when do we make the CAC back fully and get into the profit part of the customer life cycle? So how many months into the customer lifetime do we pay back our CAC? So in month zero is when we acquire the customer. So here we are saying that we put in uh, $20,000. And so the cash flow of that is negative $20,000. So we've just lost $20,000. And now we need to figure out how long is it going to take to pay that back. Then we get into the profit generating. So we know in our first month, we make uh, gross profit from both implementations. So we have the implementation gross profit, and then we have the subscription gross profit. So in month one, we make $5,890 of gross profit. So let's look here. This shows our cumulative LTV minus CAC. So you take the prior month and you just add the gross profit to it. So first we started at negative $20,000. Now we're at negative $14,000. Now what about here in month two? How much gross profit are we generating to keep paying the CAC back? So the implementation is now done. So now it's just subscription gross profit. So we can just copy this formula down. And what you'll see is that, let's just lock the cell, copy paste. We fully pay back the CAC. So we're paying it back, you know, $1,658 at a time. And it's not until month 10 where the CAC is fully paid back. And so that is our CAC payback period. That's when we break even on our relationship with the customer. And then from month 10 forward, all of the gross profit we make is profit for the company. It's no longer paying back the CAC. And then we know because our customer lifetime value is long that we make that CAC back about five more times. So the CAC payback period in this case is, we're saying it's 10 months. And so one thing I want to just briefly mention some benchmarks. So the payback period isn't super important. What's really important is the LTV to CAC ratio, because if a business has a really long customer lifetime of five years, then they can have kind of a long payback period and still make a lot of money on the customer. But if your lifetime value is really, really short, some businesses only have a five month lifetime value like B2C businesses, then you, you know, a three month CAC payback period would actually be really long. So always use LTV to CAC sort of as your North Star metric, but here are some benchmarks just to get kind of a flavor. So for B2B, bad is generally sort of like one to two years. So that's pretty long to pay back your CAC. Six to 12 months, which is we're in that range is sort of average. You know, it's not that long to pay back the CAC, but you're your capital, um, you know, it takes a while to, to get it back. And then less than six months is considered excellent. B to C, um, bad is sort of six to 12 months because there's so much churn that can make the business really hard to run. Average would maybe be three to six months and good would be, uh, excellent would be one to three months. Okay, so I hope this video helped you understand SAS unique economics, why they're so important and how to calculate them. As always, you can download this Excel file down in the description. Also, if you want me to teach you everything I know about finance for startups in a small group with personalized support from me, check out the link in the description below for a chance to join the next cohort of my training program, Finance for Startups. And if you found this content valuable, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next video.